Well, welcome everyone to the April 2021 MAS virtual meeting. Off we go. Uh oh, now why doesn't this work? It worked just a little bit ago. Oh, there we go. The board. I am your president, Mark Job. Uh, let's see, I heard Vault on the call tonight, and I saw Trina and Matt is on. I have not seen Gunnar or Conrad. I'm here. Hello. Hello. Excellent. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. There is everybody. There's your board. And there's our mugs. That's enough of that. <laughs> so here's the treasurer's report. Um, I will report that, Matt, we, late this afternoon, we got the uh, membership report from Steve Emmerich. Yeah. And there's 625. So every month so far this year, we've been breaking records. So we're up to 625 members. That is just super fantastic. That is incredible. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing or why we're doing it, but I know we have 625 members. We just have to figure out how we maintain those members. That's oh. truly amazing. Yeah. Cash prizes. More <laughs> cash prizes. Matt, you want to hit the treasure report? Anything Anything you want to highlight? Go for it. Well, our, our cash prize right now is $129,000. So keep putting in your tickets. There you uh, go. Is this one of those half and half drawings? Oh, oh. You know, that's not a bad idea. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, yeah, basically, uh, I'm a little slow on the draw getting the deposits in, but uh, right now we had expenses for the month of March. Um, you know, basically, we had to pay our insurance premium for all our sites and stuff like that. And then we have started on the, um, the, the, the website thing, and maybe, I don't know, Mark, maybe you want to mention something about what's going on with that, but we have paid for the first down payment of that. Yeah, I think it's in process. The ball is in um, um, vaults. Jump in. I can't remember. New New Jersey, New Jersey uh, court right yes. now. They're working on the background. To yeah, we're just out. kicking it off, and uh, I see that uh, Wendy from New Jersey is uh, participating. So welcome, Wendy. Hi. Hi, Wendy. Hello. So you come it's... to see what this is all about? That's I really have... cool. And my uncle, my wonderful uncle, Doug Neverman, is trying to talk me into coming out to uh, Cherry Grove, I think, sometime. Yeah. Yes. It's nearby me. I'm, I'm down in Northfield, Minnesota. So, yeah, so it's not too far for me. But quick correction, no, uh, no worries. It's Nuger is the name of Nuger. our organization. Okay. No worries. But, uh, yeah, I think that Vault's paid a third and then a third mid project and then a third at the end i think that's the plan excellent yeah thank you wendy thanks for having me you bet thank you yeah so nothing really exciting to report from the treasurer this, this time but uh just the usual business i have a question sure so the 4488 for insurance is that more or less or about the same as what we've paid in the past uh, it's significantly more than last year. I think it was 36 or something like that, 3,600 last year. I'm suspecting there's a couple things going on. One is we had the claim for the dome, when, you know how insurance companies are. Yep. <clears throat> and then um, we are probably declaring more stuff. So we got to. Yep. So. Because we have more stuff. Yes. So um, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other any, any other members on this call have any questions? All right, very good. We're going to move on. Excellent. Ron Schmidt, um, I'm going to pass this on to you, and you're going to do a little tribute for us for one of our members that passed on. That's right. Well, if you've been uh, following along the forum, you would see that uh, Lauren Nelson passed away. Lauren Nelson was a, uh, a longtime member of the MAS. In fact, one of the uh, founding, one of the founding fathers of the group. Uh, he was uh, passed away at age 76. He was born in 1944, lived in St. Paul all his life, and uh, was in hospice and passed away on February 23rd. 
parents Alfred and Verna, brother Alfred Jr., sister-in-law Camille Nelson, uh, nieces, grandnieces, grandnephews, cousins, a uh, lot of a uh, lot of family recognizing his passing, and uh, yeah, I count us in uh, part of that family. He was a graduate of U of M. He was a Gopher, graduated in chemistry, uh, co-founding member in November of 1972. Jim Fox was the president of the 3M Astronomy Club. And they had, uh, I don't know, about 20, 25 people members at the time. And there were interests, uh, there was an interest from non-3M employees and their club required only 3M employees as often company sponsored clubs will do. And so they decided to branch out and make a new group. And Lauren was part of that uh, original group that signed the papers back in November 72 and got us all started. Uh, since then, he has also paid a, uh, played a critical role in organizing our monthly meeting speakers. And man, did he come up with some great speakers, especially local talent, professors from the U of M coming over to share their research. I always enjoyed those the most. He was also very active with Marcy, the Minnesota area remote control electronic enthusiasts. So as you can tell from their logo, uh, they did RC planes, but they were dedicated to flying just electric powered radio controlled craft. So a very niche group. Their group has about 55 people in it and uh, they have various uh, spots that they fly in, including a 3M flying site down in Cottage Grove. And Lauren was a real innovator before anyone else, I think. He had a camera on his drones and a pretty high def camera. So he would fly around and take footage. He was always a fixture at the monthly meetings. You could see him there. He was the guy usually right up front, making sure everything went off without a hitch. Always up front. Always. And even way back then, it's probably what, looking at Dave, that's probably about what, 40, 45 years ago, Dave? Uh, yeah, about that. <laughs> One guy mentioned he was always looking for new ideas. And I think that kind of wraps him up. Scientifically and intellectually curious, they said. And that was him to a T. Uh, I don't know if you members could help me out in the chat. I believe that's Jeff Brown uh, on, on his right side. There, I guess that would be his left, but right side of the screen. I was trying to find that guy's name and I chatted with Steve and that guy's not even a member. And I would see him all the time with Lauren at the planetarium, at various uh, scientific symposiums. And while it was interesting too, a pretty cerebral dude. <laughs> I love that look. He was always, although not extroverted, he was always very personable. And I always enjoyed chatting with him. It was always shop though. And I realized that as he passed, I, I didn't know a whole lot about him outside of the MAS, but he was a, a great servant, a great member of the club. And yeah, one of those people that makes it such a great club, a great foundation. Here he is receiving a MAS member of the year from Mr. Faulkner. There was his kind of a regalo wing design on his electric plane. That was one of his drones that had a camera on board it. And there he is operating it, coming down for a landing. There's the footage of the uh, JJ Casby Observatory. And then you can see out into the St. Croix Valley with Afton there off to the right. The rest of the Bellwind Conservancy. Pretty cool stuff. I knew him also as someone that we would see at the planetarium all the time. Always helping out with the equipment. There we can see taking, taking the star ball apart at the very end. So Lauren will be deeply missed. They're gonna have a remembrance for him at the uh, late in the summer. So we'll watch for that. And hopefully we can share that with everybody and give you an opportunity to share with his family uh, and to remember Lauren. All right, back to you, Space Gandalf. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much, Ron, for that. I failed. I failed while we were gone. Oh, boy. 
So I had slides in here. I had slides. So, okay. Just to let all you members know that the MAS is on YouTube and the board has been pushing and uh, maybe we need to work a little harder to let everybody know that this is, a, it's our intention to make uh, the YouTube channel, the MAS YouTube channel, the repository for all of the MAS videos uh, and, and anything else. So if anybody has, has old content that you think should be shared, um, get a hold of somebody on the board and uh, we'll work on getting that up there. Um, it's our intention that this will be the only repository for um, for video that the MAS has created. And our intention is, is that it's going to be organized in, in um, 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 what do you call it, channels, or it's uh, actually playlists. So as you can see here, currently we have four playlists. I'm getting ready to add a fifth playlist, which would be kind of an MAS general thing. Um, and the video that I'm going to upload is, is Steve Emirates, uh, um, introduction or orientation to the MAS and it will be uh it'll be up there because it's uh I, I think I'm almost done editing it uh I was trying to do uh some things to put in some some bookmarks and things like that and it, it just isn't going well so I think I'm just gonna upload it as one big hunk and uh with the slideshow that would be posted then on the forum I think between the two of those you would be able to scroll through quickly and, and get to where you want to go. Um, so that's our intention there. Um, is Anton Gregory on? I am here. Anton, excellent. Take it, take it away, the loaner scope program. Okay, well, as always, members can request a loaner scope from the website under members, loaner scope program. Um, so far, we have loaned 18 telescopes this year. About half of them are available, half of them are out right now. Um, the news is that we've just increased our inventory from 13 to 14, thanks to a recent donor and Steve Emmert's expert skills. We have a second um, Celestron 8SE Schmidt Cassegrain that just went into service today. So again, um, Members can request these on our website and they can also request the DVD short courses. Um, a couple of them are out, but others are in. So um, make your selections and I will get back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Gregory. Any questions from anybody? Terrific. Moving like right along. Celestial events before the May meeting. Um, so, couple days here we got last quarter moon which i'm excited about because i don't know if anybody's paid attention today it's clear so um i'm excited my observatory is already open the sct is cooling down uh so then the next thing is uh last quarter moon saturn in the morning jupiter in the morning with the moon actually it's really early in the morning and i think it was like uh uh, just after midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, something like that, I think is what I saw on the, on the thing, on the, on the, on the list. Um, new moon, always exciting, new moon weekend um, on the 11th. Um, and then something that I didn't realize is that the Lyrid meteor shower, uh, it's, not a, it's not a very big one, it's like 20 or something per hour, uh, it's max peak, but the only thing is, is that that darn moon is in the way. Um, because it's after first quarter and so the moon doesn't set till till 4 30 in the morning and that's only going to give you about an hour before before we, uh, it starts getting light out so not a lot of fun and then the first super moon of the year i know ron gets excited about about super moons um so that happens on uh april 26th and then we come back around to last quarter and um, the one thing I saw there was Mercury uh, within two degrees of Pleiades. That's interesting. And then everybody's favorite, Star Wars Day on May the 4th. Coincidentally, my birthday. Oh, that's right, Dave Faulkner. I knew that. Yep. So, yeah, so what a reason to celebrate. Absolutely. 
And then on May 6th, obviously, we were back here again uh, with a virtual meet, uh, monthly meeting. Um, and, and for those of you that were not early and heard the conversation, um, we, we're probably going to maintain these virtual meetings for a while yet, A, because we don't have a place to live um, where we could meet face to face because the building that we were in is, uh, well, it's going to be torn down. I heard it's not torn down yet, but we were notified that it was torn down and they actually told us to come and get our stuff out of the locker. So that's, you know, that kind of tells us that we don't have a home. Um, they have promised us to at least uh, engage with us when they're ready. Um, and we're, the board is working on finding something, something else, um, something, something, uh, you know, we're trying to keep it, you know, centrally located in the metro area and everybody knows that is a, that's an issue. I mean, to find a place that will accommodate us uh, the first Thursday of every month, that makes it a challenge. Um, and for the hours that we want, you know, 6.30 or so to something after 9, 9.30 or so, you know, that's kind of difficult. And, you know, we're working on it. We, we, we have, uh, we have uh, one to look at and uh, consider. Um, the only thing is, is, you know, we don't know when yet. What, you know, what's going to happen with this COVID thing? When is that going to uh, release us so that we can get together and, and not need a huge space or limit the number of members that can show up? You know, I'd rather not have to do that. I'd like to be able to open it up to everyone. Um, you know, what would, you know, maybe, maybe an idea could be is that we, if we can meet somewhere outside, you know, um, but then that becomes a challenge because we gotta, we have to present. So that's a bunch of challenges. So let's see, let's move on. So star party's coming up. We are in star party season. So April 3rd at ELO is a public star party. And I know Merle has uh, set up uh, a reservation uh, uh, process and they're having a, a work party and all kinds of things this, this Saturday. So if, you, if you're free and can, can help out and you're a key holder, certainly um, get on there and sign up. Uh, they're on the forums, on the ELO uh, forums. And uh, I'm sure he could use some help. Um, and then uh, again on, on April 17th, I'm, I'm sure the same thing will go. Um, I'm sure he's looking for some key holders to help out. Um, Merle, is, Merle, are you on? Is that also the same weekend that you're having um, key holder training? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, that's what I thought I remembered. So cool. And I thought you have called that full. You, you're not taking any more members for key holder training, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we have training for uh, JJ Casby on the 10th and uh, ELO on the 17th. Both of those are full, uh, but I plan on having uh, another session for each uh, relatively soon. That's great. Good idea. And then uh, the MES Beginners Interest Group has their star party at ELO on April 24th. Um, same COVID or uh, rules are going to apply there for that star party as apply for um, uh, the public star parties um, with waivers being signed. That way we can maintain contact tracing and things like that um, and reservations uh, to a certain degree. And Shref will probably talk about that a little more later when he comes up. Uh, and then we have member activities going on. Um, the Messier Marathon is actually going on now. Um, which I'll talk about a, a little bit more in a second, but it ends April 10th. Um, and then there's star parties at CGO, uh, April 9th and the 10th and, and uh, the 16th and the 17th. I know Ken Hugel is on and I'm going to have him talk about the star parties at LLCC because there's some um, a little bit different than we normally have. It's uh, out of the ordinary. It's kind of exciting that we actually are going to be able to go up there and have a star party this year. Um, so, Ken, if you're on and you go ahead and open your mic and talk about it. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so the LLCC is still closed to the public. Uh, they're still kind of in a dormant mode. They just hired a new director that's going to be uh, working on getting things fired back up. Uh, they're only going to be open for us and school kids starting, I think, in August. Um, so there won't be any other groups on site when we're there uh, for our star parties. Um, the um, star parties have been forwarded on to, so they'll, so they'll show up online here uh, shortly for um, LLCC, and they'll be listed in the next uh, Gemini. Um, we are asking that everybody that's thinking about going, possibly going to go, please post on the forums um, that you're planning on going and then give us a go or no go when you make that decision because um, LLCC is asking us to provide them with a count on the number of rooms that we're going to need. Uh, due to COVID, uh, we're requiring that one person stay in a room unless it's a family. Um, so um, that can add up to quite a few rooms. And up until I think last week, the sheriff's department was using a lot of the rooms because there were protests going on for the pipeline and they were um, occupying those rooms. So I'm not sure what the status of that is right now, but. Uh, we do need to get a count each and every time now um, for who's going to go up so I can provide that to them so they can unlock the doors, open the gate, um, stuff like that. So that'll be, I'll post a little blurb on the uh, forums on what, what uh, we're requiring you to do, but um, just go ahead and uh, list on there whether you're going or not going up to the uh, LLCC and if you plan to stay overnight in a room or not. So Ken, for the monthly uh, uh, star parties up there, they're not charging us, right? Just like before? No, we are paying a, we are in the process of uh, working out um, a new rate um, for the usage of LLCC. Uh, currently it was $600 per year. And then we could get a discount of $100 per um, um, outreach event that we provided down to a minimum, I think, of possibly $200, something like that. But um, they are calculating how much it costs for them to clean the rooms after uh, usage, how much electricity we use, all those different factors uh, go into that. And we're negotiating a new uh, rate. Um, it's not, you know, super substantially uh, increased, but there'll be a new rate. And some of that may be based on usage, on room usage. Um, especially kind of during this COVID period, but um, they need to recover the cost to clean those rooms after our use. So Ken, uh, are they restricting the number of rooms we're able to use? Well, um, he kind of waffled back and forth. I think if we ask for like, you know, you know, five to 10 rooms, you know, we're probably okay if we want to go over that you know it um they definitely need to know that and he needs to see what you know what availability is there i think the markham house has boy what did he say 20 some rooms so yeah okay and ken you're gonna let them know if if we're gonna cancel cancel because it's cloudy and nobody's gonna be up there isn't that right yeah, I'm supposed to let them know if everybody cancels. So that's why I would appreciate the, everybody, you know, if they decide not to go to let me know so they don't waste their time going out and unlocking doors and unlocking gates and then nobody shows up. Um, so we're just trying to do them a courtesy so they don't have to drive in from, from town to do all this stuff when nobody shows um, and then just the opposite of that too, last year, the very first star party, nobody unlocked anything for us and we had to hurry up and try and get a hold of somebody. So um, we want to try and get an early estimate of how many people are thinking about going and then try to get that number narrowed down to an exact number. Um, you know, the, at least the day of for sure. And it might be helpful 
uh, I was one of the people, along with Anton and a couple others last fall, who went up there and the doors were locked. It might be helpful if we knew who to contact, um, you know, in case it's a similar situation with the number. Yeah, we do have uh, a contact number. Um, I haven't decided whether everybody should contact me first and then that number as a secondary, just so, you know, we don't have a whole bunch of people calling at the same time or something like that. But I'll put that information on the um, forums here in the next day or two. Hey, Ken, are you yes. going to be starting the forum threads for each Star Party weekend? Um, or is that anybody's go? I could do that, yes. I could start one for any each Star Party weekend. Yeah, that way you can kind of keep a nice... That's a good idea. Yep. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Thank you. And then, just, to, just so everybody knows, us as the MAS we have created um, special COVID rules and actually we're allowing, I don't know, I think uh, 15 on the field up there or was it 25 on the field up there and 15 could stay. I can't remember exactly. Ken, I sent you the rules. Maybe you want to repost those. Um, I, yeah, I can repost those. And that's, also what, that's what LLCC has. We gave that to them. And so they know what, what, what our intention is because we were going to allow people to come up use the field, but not necessarily stay overnight. Um, and that was, you know, that was, that was us, us trying to accommodate more people to the field, um, you know, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Hey, Mark. Yes, Merle. Um, I did post those rules. The uh, link is on the homepage to the member uh, site rules. Okay. okay. Great. And then there is, uh... Not necessarily in April, but after the first two star parties here, um, I think we're going to be able to have you bring your own camper and park in the parking lot if you want to stay in your camper. But there'll be like a $20 a night fee for that. Um, and they just provide 110 power and, um, you know, no out, there will be no outhouse there. We'd have to use the Markham house for um, showers or bathroom facilities, but. And no yeah. tents. No tents. I don't think you were going to allow us to have tents. No, no tents. But if you have an RV or a pop-up camp or something, um, we'll be able to park it on the uh, parking lot uh, the, behind the um, cafeteria there during star parties. Very good. Anybody have any other concerns or questions about LLCC and the star parties? Well, not specifically about that, but I mean, everybody I know has had their shots now. And I assume that probably three quarters of you have. Are there any changes in the rules with all that? Nope. And then we, I we, got one. We, we haven't considered it yet. Is there going to be a Northern Lights uh, star party this year since we're on the topic? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, yep, we're planning that. Um, the dates, I believe, the dates will be are posted um, on the website along with uh, the Star Party list. Um, the dates are September 1st, I believe, through the 6th. Uh, please verify that on the website, though. And... Um, there's no sign up or anything yet. The new director is, is, as soon as the new director gets on board and everything like that, uh, we'll probably nail down the uh, the menu and the sign up and all that stuff around May timeframe. All right, very good. We gotta move along. Um, I, I have another quick question. Um, Cherry Grove, what's the state of the field, Cherry Grove? Is it okay, squishy? It, it might be a little squishy, that's about it, I think. They, uh, Doug Neverman's probably been there the most, I think. And he would probably have the best assessment. And I know he's on tonight. The The field is actually in pretty good shape. I, there's still some water and it's a bit squishy, but all the snow is gone and and uh, and usable. The The parking lot is is uh, certainly squishy, but uh, uh, and and your tires will leave marks in the, in the, in the parking lot, but uh, it's it's actually in pretty good shape. Okay, thanks.
Okay, so just to let everybody know, we have until April 10th to finish uh, the Messier Marathon. Um, you know, the same rule still, still applies. Choose a night, one night, log your observations and submit it to Jerry. Deadline is April 15th. Jerry will let us know the winners. Faults, you're on. All right, so I did take up Jerry's challenge. Um, a group of us headed down to uh, the uh, Mesa Valley Guest House in early March, and uh, and I took one of those nights and took an opportunity to try my first Messier Marathon, but I did it a little differently. I tried to image every single object, so this is kind of the process that I did. All right, so it really starts with planning. So I looked up the, uh, uh, the order of the observations and used that website, uh, Larry McNish's Messier Marathon website planner. And it basically, you put in your coordinates and put in the date and time, and uh, it spits out a list of uh, the, the imaging, uh, the, the order that you should observe, starting with M74. And it, it, it has some remarks as well. It says some things, are difficult to see because they're low in the horizon or um, they're in the glare of the sun. So it's like, uh, for example, here, the first one, M74, it says it's a large uh, face-on galaxy, but it's gonna be very low low in altitude at sunset in March. So it's, it's, a, it's one of the challenging ones to start with. So uh, that's, but that's where I started with. And so uh, I decided to give this a go. Um, one thing it, to note, the, uh, the planner, said that the last object, M30, was not possible, and I'll, I'll get into that at the end. All right, preparation. So um, it was going to be a rather cool night, and uh, so a lot of preparation really had to take place. So I decided to fully automate the, uh, the scope and actually, so I can sit in the warm house and, and uh, and operate everything from inside because I wasn't gonna sit there all night uh, going off it. So I ended up installing a micro router onto my scope and it integrates well with the Los Monte mount and everything. So I was able to fully control everything from uh, inside the house through a BNC connection uh, onto a laptop. So the first thing I did, uh, I double checked polar alignment. It was polar aligned from the previous night's observing. But um, as soon as the pole stars were visible, I double checked it through the, the mount, everything was good. Then um, as it started to get dark, uh, lined and synchronized the mount to Aldebaran and then calibrated uh, PHD, the guiding software to Aldebaran as well. Check focused also on Aldebaran. And uh, it was still quite light out and, uh, but everything was, it was so clear and dark down there. It was. Uh, still visible. So then I just slewed to the first target, M74 and Pisces. One thing I forgot to do, and it'll and it bit me in the end at the end, is I forgot to turn on the dew heater on my uh, guiding scope. So by the by the morning at about 4 a.m., my guide scope started to frost over. We didn't have frost issues the whole whole time we were there, except that one night. So that kind of bit me, but uh, it was it still worked. All right. This is inside the house. Here's the command center. So the key things, the Messier Marathon essentials. First of all, it's warm inside. I'm not a cold weather guy. So um, I did everything through the laptop and only ran out when I had to. So uh, laptop, the wireless VNC connection, solid to the scope, had my list, a big cup of coffee and a pot in the, in the kitchen. And then of course, also uh, simultaneously drinking the beer. Very, very important. All right, capture process. So basically for every single object, I slewed the telescope to the target using APT, which is my capture software, previewed the image, made sure it's uh, centered. I tweaked the, tweaked the position if I had to uh, manually. Then I uh, flipped over to PhD and, and enabled guiding. Exposed a three minute, single three minute exposure on every single object I can. And uh, and then while it's exposing, I took the preview image, plate solved the preview image, and then synced them out uh, to the preview image just to make sure everything is, is, is synced up. And then I moved on. So uh, the reason it's so, it's, there's not a lot of time to do this. So each object 
had about five minutes time budget. So there's 110 objects times five minutes, 550 minutes, which is over nine hours expected runtime for the whole marathon. So it's just a, it's a constant on, 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 on. You got, you can't miss any beat. So uh, between the, the dark time between sundown and sunrise, about nine hours and 40 minutes. So I did not have a lot of leeway to, to get everything else in there. The, the nice thing about the planner it only uh, made me do a meridian flip once, which, which ended up being really, really good because the meridian flip, I had to do some extra calibration and stuff to recalibrate the guiding. So, uh, and there were a bunch of objects also um, that are two in a view. So you get two, two objects for the price of one. So that's kind of bonus time for me. And the fact that I've got a F3.3 uh, Takahashi Epsilon helps to get nice wide field of view. All right, so Processing. So after all of the images were processed, um, I figured out in uh, um, PixInsight, the image process software, um, I, and it's really the first time I've used image containers and process containers. So I basically automated the, every single uh, object, every single image that I did automatically applied to flat frames, bias frames, um, did automatic background extraction and did a, did a mask stretched and saved it out as a, as a file, each as a PNG file for the output. I had to do a couple of them manually because some of the big nebula like the M42 just didn't turn out uh, very well in the automatic mode. And then at the very end, when I had uh, a batch of good pictures, I used uh, IrfanView software, which is a freeware graphics program uh, for Windows to automatically label, label uh, using batch processing all of the, uh, all of the images. So uh, I put together this a little movie and uh, kind of goes through and, and spends a few seconds on each image and uh, enjoy. And it is in order of capture, so as same. So one thing to know, I every image, the the objects are all at the same scale, so you can get a relative relative uh, notion to the size of each object.
fading away. The last object, M30, should have been right there. And uh, it was, as you can see, this picture taken by Don Gadzik, the scope was po pointed basically right at the horizon and uh, just could not get M30 behind the Mesa. So uh, the, uh, the prediction software said it couldn't do it and it, it was right. So I got 109 out of 110. That's amazing, Bolt. Congratulations. Thank you for that. Great job. That's crazy. Shresh, if you're on, the floor is yours. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, uh, the, spe the beginner special interest group, uh, we had a presentation, I think was on the 27th. I presented uh, all about deep sky objects. We had about 46 people. Uh, Matt, don't correct me on that. I think you said 46 attended. Uh, if anybody wants to see the recorded version, uh, the link is here. It's also on the, uh, the BSIG forum, uh, if you want to check that out. I think it went about two hours and five minutes in total. Um, coming up on April 17th, Steve Emmer will be presenting Astronomy Terms. Uh, Steve, did you want to speak on that, or would you like me to just read the synopsis? <laughs> Probably the synopsis is fine, and that is definitely a pun at the end of it. Okay. Uh, as is the case with any technical vocation or hobby, astronomy comes with its own specialized language full of unusual terms and acronyms that can make it confusing to the beginner. In this B6 session, we will speak to many of these terms, which we hope will clear the skies for you. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and then, as, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, we have tentatively scheduled the first BSIG observing session for Eagle Lake Observatory on Saturday the 24th, starting at 6 p.m. Uh, the April BSIG is always weather dependent, um, and we moved it over to Eagle Lake because of a couple of reasons. Uh, the, Met the Metcalf field may not be totally dry by then, and also we still don't have AC power out there. And so I know some of the beginners uh, in particular need AC power. So for that reason, Eagle Lake was selected for this one. And depending on how it goes uh, in the next months after, we might stay at Eagle Lake Observatory. We'll just have to see. Uh, attendance rules, as uh, Mark had mentioned, we're going to base it on the state and the MAS COVID guidelines. I, I, uh, Merle, I looked at the rules that you posted online. I didn't see a number. Is there a number cap? for uh, how many we can invite for the attendees? Oh, well, for our public events, we've kind of got a number of uh, 50 total, yeah. but we've got two groups of 25. Yeah, 50 is what I saw for the state guideline as well. I just wanted to make sure. So 50 is the number, right? Okay. All right, cool, thank you. Okay, so yeah, we'll follow the protocols. We'll have people fill out the forms. Uh, we'll keep an attendance log of who's coming, uh, and we'll do that on the BSIC forum. I'll probably send out a note for that about a week to 10 days before the event. So if you're interested, please sign up. And if you're bringing family members or children or what have you, please do include that so I can keep track of the, the number of attendees. Uh, does anybody have any questions with the BSIC? Oh, Trish, let me, uh, let me comment again. On the attendance for the public, uh, we have that uh, larger number. Mm -hmm. um, I think a number with uh, observers and telescopes, it's considerably less than that. So let's let's double check the um, the rules for uh, for members use. Okay, I'm not really following, but we can take this offline, Merle, and and figure that out. Okay, it was just we needed that twelve foot separation between telescopes. Oh, I see. 12 feet. It's not six feet, it's 12 feet. 12 feet between telescopes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But let's check the rules and we'll post that on the forum. Good deal. Um, and one thing we're looking at doing this year is getting back more into uh, the observing side with the BSIG. So I've asked a couple of people to help volunteer. We're going to create a uh, list for people uh, to try to find some objects and try to do a little more hands on visual work than we have in the last couple of years. I think that with COVID, uh, there was a definite drop off in you know, how many people we can invite and the things that we could do. And hopefully we can return to some, some sense of normalcy this year. Thanks, Mark. Yep. 
Public service announcement. This is the only one I know of. Um, it's still on as far as I know. Um, there's an astrophotography workshop August 7th. Um, we got Mike Shaw going to help us out with that. And uh, between Doug Neverman and I, we'll support that um, as needed. Um, we're still laying out the agenda. Um, and then the only other public service announcement I'm, I'm also aware of is uh, training at CGO. Um, anybody, any member um, that is in good standing, obviously, um, can go sign up and be trained on the imaging rig. Well, and that, for that matter, the whole site. I mean, you can become a key holder down there so that you can also use the uh, the, the BAD and uh, and the, the LX200. Um, you know, those are, are both fine instruments also. Uh, it's, you know, so you just have to watch the form and, uh, and, 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 and again, sign up. Um, we do have limitations as to how many people can be inside the observatory and how many people can be inside the warming room. Um, and it's, you know, and, and how many people can be on the field, but I don't think the limitation is to how many can be on the field. I don't think that's the issue. The issue more is, is when it's a chilly night, how many people are going to be needing to get into, uh, uh, the warming room to warm up. And then, you know, when there are people that want to use the, um, uh, the, 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 the LX200, and 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 use the imaging rig at the same time. I, I realized then that it's, it, it might it may get a, what we would call a little crowded, um, and because I think the maximum people in there would be like two or three uh, max in there, um, and of course masks are being worn. So if you're interested, uh, watch the forums. I know there's training sessions and they'll be scheduled periodically. Um, training sessions for the imaging rig will be uh, surrounded around the uh, weekend of, uh, of, of full moon, um, just because, you know, it's training. Um, you're not, you're, you're probably not going to get a full session of uh, images anyway, but you'll get to learn how to use that equipment. And uh, it's really quite straightforward, at least uh, uh, for me as a, as a user of that, 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 that equipment, uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's not complicated. We've, we've done a good job. Doug Neverman has done a fabulous job of uh, creating a, a curriculum and uh, going through it. And he's created videos. And, you know, if you're interested, certainly get a hold of Doug and he will get you set up and get you pointed in that direction to, uh, to, to learn that. Mark, uh, just real quick, is Doug the only one doing the training uh, still? No, Robert, Robert and Conrad are in uh, uh, in process of, of, of taking that over. Um, so it's not just going to be Doug. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the whole group. Excellent. Thanks. Hey, Mark. Yes. Is the astrophotography workshop just for using with the telescope, or is it something that can be used with the DSLR cameras? This year, it's going to be with DSLR camera, mostly with nightscape photography, just as it says on the slide. Okay. Well, so it's, it's not this year. It's not specifically aimed at the telescope okay. and using a telescope to take pictures. It's it's nightscape. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for that. Actually, thanks for helping that help me out with that. That's uh, important for everybody to know. Yeah, because I don't know necessarily what nightscape photography means to the in layman's terms. Yeah. Great. So I'm an old timer. Cottage Grove was being in, in, um, encroached by um, the neighbor's um, garage light 20 years ago. And I went down last summer and the light is still there and it's still on. Has anyone have been brave enough to talk to this neighbor and get a response about whether or not they could turn it out when we have a star party down there? If you're talking about the neighbor to the east, I believe that a light shield has been put up on that light. And I don't believe that that is an issue any longer. Well, uh, let me interject. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. Good. It appears to have blown off in one of the high winds that we had over the winter or spring, and we've got to readdress it again. Okay. Thanks, Steve. It's to the east or to the west? It's it's not towards Goodview County 1. It's the opposite side. You mean the guy behind the fence? Well, it was dark. I didn't see any fence, but I did see the light. <laughs> the light is still there. <laughs> And it looks like it's to his garage and to his house. There's two lights, I think, if I remember. Not, maybe, that, maybe I'm wrong, but 
I do remember thinking, my gosh, 20 years and nobody's talked to a farmer about this light? Well, he tore down a bunch of trees recently <laughs> because they were covered up by the trees before that. No, we, we are aware of it and we're working on, uh, we do, you know, we did get the permission to put a shield up on that really bright garage light that was directly to the east of us by about mm, quarter mile or whatever it is. And we put that up last fall, but unfortunately it blew down and that's a naked light bulb right now. So we're going to look at uh, IDA compliant light fixtures and just replace the whole things. So uh, we did get permission the first time. We're anticipating that we'll get permission this time around to put up something nicer looking and hopefully a little bit more durable. So do we own that land or does someone own it who leases it to us or what's the status of that? Cherry Grove, we own that little bitty chunk of land. Own it. So we don't own anything else. That's it. Well, okay. Right. Wow. Okay. Nice. Yeah, it was a uh, tax foreclosure, so we got it at a really good price years and years ago. I think back, uh, I think I remember hearing in 78 or 80 or 81, 82, something like that. Maybe one of the older members would know what the date was, but it was quite a while ago. Thanks, Steve. Jaminy articles. Father Brown, as always, is looking for more. He hasn't contacted me. And that's a good thing because that means he has enough to fill out the most recent issues of the Gemini. But I am sure that he would be interested in receiving more. So if you have something, anything, astronomy related, equipment related, you know, somewhere you've been, realize that nobody has probably been anywhere, but you know, there has been a, a few people that I know that have snuck off somewhere. Um, and uh, and had some experiences. So anything you can think of, you know, if maybe there's a tutorial you'd like to write and, and have produced in there, um, certainly contact Father Brown. He will certainly help you. Um, I know he pro will provide some editing to some degree and some 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 uh, guidance. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Thank you. Ah, better know a constellation. And as I've been threatening since I became president of this organization that we are going to do a constellation every month, I'm going to continue that tradition. And this month we're going to do Virgo because it's galaxy season. Um, so what I know about galaxy or of, of, of Virgo is that it rises after sunset in the early spring. And for me, when it rises, it, it hangs out in light pollution for at least a few hours um, before I can get it placed high enough and away from the light pollution before I can start taking a look at it or even before I can begin imaging, which is most likely what I want to do anyway. Um, I know that Virgo has a bunch of clusters in it. I had no idea until I started doing the research for this presentation. I also knew that, Spike, that Spica was the bright star um, because it's an obvious star and it's a pointer star or it's the result of a pointer star. Um, that's why I knew it was there. That's why I knew where Virgo was. Um, but I've learned more. Um, so here it is. Uh, I didn't realize that it sat on the ecliptic. You know, and maybe I guess if I had taken a step back and thought about it for a while, I'd have figured it out um, that, you know, because it sits on the ecliptic, it is a zodiac. Um, so there it is. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh it's uh, it's big. Um, I didn't realize that it was the second largest constellation in in our sky, um, and uh, it's uh, I didn't realize it was a female either. That was the other piece that I thought was kind of cool. Um, is that um, it's it's depicted with angel wings and and uh, um, or angel like wings and a, and a, a ear of wheat that is uh, in her left hand, marked by the bright star Spike. And, ah, that's kind of cool stuff and. Now I will, I mean, from my, from my yard, when I look at it, I can see Porma and, and, and Spica, uh, you know, the rest of the stars, they're, they're kind of difficult to make out because, you know, I, I, I don't live in the best sky. So, um, and I can't imagine what it's like for anybody that lives in the metro area. You guys probably see Spica and that's about it. So uh, what I learned, you know, I went, wow, there are galaxy clusters there. 
you know, and then I realized that uh, it was a popular target for Charles Messier. And, you know, he's got, he's got 11 objects in there and none of those objects were comets. Um, and so there's a list of the 11 objects. Um, what I thought was kind of cool is that this was a Greek goddess um, and uh, uh, it's pronounced DK. Um, DK was the daughter of Zeus and, 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 and Theomis, I believe I pronounced that. I'm, I'm sure I butchered that, um, but DK uh, was, uh, lived in the golden age of mankind. Uh, she was born a more mortal and placed on earth to rule over human justice. I'm like, All right, that's kind of cool. That's good. And I thought that was enough. Uh, I read enough about uh, mythology at that point, and I, and I, 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 I moved on. Um, and I discovered that there are two um, meteor showers that are associated with the constellation. I'd never heard of them. I don't see them show up on lists, so they must be really quite um, not very significant. Um, and I don't know. I didn't take the time to go look to see what time of the year they are. Um, uh, the virginids and the, uh, the mu virginids, you know, something that, that, that you can look up later. Um, you know, so I found that there's Marcanian's chain is there and it's, you know, I mean, that's a group of galaxies. Uh, I was actually experimenting a little bit last night with it and found out that I need a bigger, bigger field of view for my, for my C11, which that ain't going to happen. So I won't be putting a hyperstar on that. Um, so I can get a bigger field of view. I'll just go with what I got. Um, but there's single galaxies like M104, which really doesn't get high enough for me. It's kind of in the trees. Um, NGC 4216 and NGC 4526, very awesome looking um, um, single galaxies. They'd be kind of fun. Uh, double galaxies like the Eyes Galaxy uh, 4435 and 4438. Um, I actually, in Waltz's um, presentation, I actually saw them pop up on the, on the very edge of one of his uh, one of his frames. Uh, of, of, Kind of cool. So I did see them on their vaults, just to let you know. And then there's the Siamese twins, which is the the, the butterfly galaxies, the uh, NGC 4567 and 4568, which, you know, I, I kind of penciled those two targets in because I believe that they'll be high enough for me. Um, so I understand now why the MAS has a, uh, has a Virgo venture. And, you know, I encourage each of you to get out there when that is happening. Uh, uh, weather cooperating and, and, you know, go through that Virgo venture because uh, the Virgo cluster, which is part of uh, Coma, Coma Berenices, um, you know, those two constellations actually share that, that cluster. And wow, I just went, there's, there's literally thousands of galaxies. And I was right when I did a little more research, I found out that there's 1300 galaxies and there could possibly be even 2000. So I just can't imagine. Um, it's quite a uh, it's quite a, a healthy group of uh, 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 of galaxies in that area. It's it's re really awesome. So get out there, check it out. Uh, Jerry Jones is uh, out of state. Um, he uh, he's uh, with his family in Virginia. Um, I understand that his mother passed away uh, just this week. So thoughts and prayers with Jerry and his family this week. Uh, he told me that he had no awards, but he did want me to remind you to get out there and observe while he was gone. So here we are up to the top of the hour. And uh, Michael, are you on? I am going to stop sharing. So Dr. I am. Dr. Coughlin, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. And uh, you should be able to share your screen and do your presentation. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for uh, coming and doing a presentation for us tonight. Well, you shouldn't thank me until you've, <laughs> until you've heard it. <laughs> well, um, it'll be great. I know it will. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, on... This was this was really fabulous to listen to for the for this meeting, and I know nothing about knew nothing about the Virgo cluster, so that was that was really informative. Um, so I'm Michael. Uh, I grew up in Burnsville. I went to college uh, down in Northfield at Carleton. Um, then I went away for a while, uh, got a PhD, um, and then I 
and back now um, as a, an a assistant professor in the physics department at the U. Um, and so I had, uh, I sort of reached out and tried to understand what folks do about LIGO and that kind of thing. And uh, not, um, it was a little ambiguous coming back. So uh, I apologize in advance if things here are a little basic, but uh, hopefully we'll um, feel free to interrupt with questions. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what I, what we know as multi-messenger astronomy. Okay, so, uh, you know, I don't have to make the case to this group that in general, when most people think of astronomy, they're thinking of observations with different kinds of light, right? And so, uh, and we cover all sorts of wavelengths, of course, in this, in this group, um, most folks are gonna be, you know, optical astronomers, right? But of course, um, in, you know, if I walk down the hall of my department, you know, I, it sort of runs the gamut of, of wavelengths here, right? And so, um, you know, x-ray observations, the UV, the visible, mid infrared, radio, right? And so these are all observations of the same galaxy, um, in this case, Centaurus A. Um, and so the point is when you, re you really require all of these observations to get a complete picture of this galaxy. Um, for example, this is one of the best known active galactic nuclei, um, it, which just means that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy that's interacting with its, um, with gas that surrounds it. Um, and so it's really through the, the, let's say, willingness to observe across wavelengths that you really um, get a complete picture of, um, you know, objects like this. And so the, the reason I bring this up is because, um, so I am today gonna be talking about um, a relatively new field, right? So most, you know, the, the optical observations we're talking about have been, um, have been going on for, for a while. Uh, whereas the messenger that I'm gonna discuss today has really only seen its um, heyday in the last seven years or so. And so to get there, um, we're starting with Newton's gravity, right? So um, where uh, we'll uh, hopefully start in a place that everyone's comfortable with. Um, and so the, the basic idea here, right, is, um, you know, Newton sitting under the tree, apple falls, hits him in the head and gets this idea for, you know, how gravity works. And so this, uh, you know, and this has been the case since the, um, uh, you know, the late 1600s and was an incredibly successful theory for explaining gravitational phenomena, right? And so the, the classic F equals MA equation with, you know, force is this gravitational constant, which people have measured to, you know, very, you know, very, very many digits. Um, and, you know, the two masses, mass of two objects divided by R squared, and it's been tested on, you know, the smallest to the largest length scales. You know, I just refereed a paper about, um, you know, some, you know, piece of gold or something like that, you know, that uh, they set the, the greatest limit on G known or something like that. Anyways, uh, so this is, this has been a highly, highly, highly successful theory that, you know, astronomers and everyone else has been using for a very, very long time. Um, and so the, so at its, at its simplest, it's, you know, gravity is, is nice in some sense, right? It's the weakest force. So it's easy. It's relatively, um, uh, well, it's, you know, hard to study here on earth. We can, you know, look outwards, um, to understand because it's dominating the, um, the attractions for most of the objects that exist out in the universe. And so, and so we're using this, you know, we're studying it with large masses, you know, the sun's keeping the planets in orbit. Um, we can here on earth measure trajectory, trajectories of balls in flight, all great. Um, okay, but so what's the problem, right? So the, the, um, uh, it was realized in the last, um, um, in, in the 1900s that there are some problems with this theory, right? And so um, Newtonian gravity works if and only if speed is small relative to the speed of light, right? So the speed of light is this, uh, is sort of the cosmic, um, you know, uh, 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 speed limit, right? And so, um, 
the the calculations really only work if the if the objects we're worried about are not moving near the speed of light and therefore not some of the astronomical objects that we'll be worried about in a little bit. Um, it also only really works if the gravitational potential is small, um, which basically means that the objects that we're talking about are relatively low mass, which is therefore not going to work with for our black holes. Um, and so uh, there are there are clearly situations where this where this doesn't apply. Um, and in 1919, we had Einstein with his theory of general relativity to, that came around and supplanted Newtonian gravity. And so we're not going to talk too much about GR but uh, we'll talk about some of the, the consequences of it and why, why we care. Okay, so uh, what does Einstein say? Nothing in the universe can travel faster than the speed of light, including information on the distribution of mass, i.e. light, the speed of light sets that cosmic speed limit for our, for example, information about gravitational effects. And so this will be really important. And so the, the, the consequence of this is, so Einstein thinks of, um, uh, instead of action at a distance where you have uh, uh, objects uh, instantaneously influencing one another, there's some fundamental speed limit, i.e. the speed of light, that dictates um, how fast that information travels. And so the way that Einstein thought about it is that you have this space-time where you have uh, instead of these objects sort of at a distance, they're influencing space-time just as a rubber sheet would as if I was to drop a mar marble or, you know, something, um, something, I take a rubber sheet and put something down in it and it bends and objects are sort of moving towards it. Um, I have a little demo I like to take to elementary schools that uh, demos this pretty well. Um, and so the, his idea is that gravitational forces are just um, objects traveling along this curved space-time, this rubber sheet. Um, and so if you have this uh, warp space-time, um, heavy things bend it, um, and the, the key feature is that the space-time is four-dimensional. So you have your um, x, y, z coordinates and some kind of time coordinate. Um, and so this was Einstein's big, um, let's say, realization. And so uh, this has a lot of consequences and one that we're gonna talk about today and those are gravitational waves. Um, and so uh, just like when I throw a rock into a pond or if I was to move the, you know, take my little marble in my rubber sheet and move it a little bit, I get ripples in my, in my, in, in my rubber sheet or in my fabric of space time. And so gravitational waves are the propagation of this effect, this gravitational effect in space time. Um, and so, Anytime you have some kind of sudden change in the distribution of matter, something explodes, I have some kind of supernova, um, things collide, I have two black holes running into each other, I have stars that are spinning super rapidly, um, I'm going to get gravitational waves. Um, and so the, the issue for the last, you know, more than 100 years, so people realized this pretty early on with GR, although they debated whether, you know, gravitational waves were real. Um, the thing is that uh, they were predicted to be very small, right? I said at the start of the talk, gravita gravity is a weak force. We, we, you know, do not experience things as, you know, being some sort of space-time. Um, and so that, that implies that for them to be high amplitude, i.e. high enough for, you know, any, for them to affect anything, um, a lot of matter needs to move around very quickly. And so the, the effect that these gravitational waves have, it turns out is as they're moving in one direction, they're expanding space in one direction and contracting it in another. So you should think of these as like doing something like this as they move closer and closer towards you and then pass through you. Um, and so they're, they're stretching you out a little bit and making you a little, making you a little shorter um, and vice versa as they move along. Um, and so this, that's what I mean when I say strain. Um, I mean just the, the relative length that you, you increase as it passes you relative to the length you have. Um, and so these, these strains that the, these gravitational waves produce, even from black holes and that kind of thing, turn out to be very, very small. And so we need to build very, very sensitive detectors to go look for them. Okay, so as I mentioned, what causes gravitational waves? The most famous example and the examples we're going to talk about in this talk are um, collisions. Um, so uh, the, um, typically we think of these as neutron star and black holes. Um, uh, 
conveniently for the last handful of decades, the um, folks have been able to use supercomputers to solve the equations of general relativity to predict and tell us what they expect the gravitational waves from two black holes or two neutron stars look like. And they have a frequency content that's similar to human hearing. And uh, the, the idea is as you move, as these black holes or these neutron stars, they're moving closer and closer together, losing energy due to gravitation waves, and then they merge. So you get this whoop type of effect. And so that's why when people usually talk about LIGO, they talk about the chirp. Um, and so you get this chirping effect as the, as the two objects get closer and closer together and merge. And so the, um, as I mentioned, there are other, there are other sources that we haven't seen yet. So we'll talk a little bit about the ones we've seen in a minute. Um, things like the um, supernovae. So when a star core collapses and then explodes um, and in general, the messier, the better. The more turbulence that you have, the larger objects that you have, the louder gravitational signals you have. And spinning, spinning stars spinning very fast are also you know, great targets for, for us too. Okay, so what does this look like in particular, the, um, the merger of these two objects? So this is a simulation that a friend of mine did actually. Um, and so the two objects at the center are these are two neutron stars, these two blue neutron stars, the yellow um, sort of, I don't know, foam or whatever coming out is the, is the gravitation waves. As they get closer and closer together, they merge. And then there's, you know, they form some kind of central object at the beginning and it's a highly spinning, in this case, neutron star at the very end that emits gravitation waves as it loses energy and spins down. And so this is the physical picture you should have. Two things come together, emitting gravitation waves, they merge, they form some kind of object, they lose some more energy and then they're, and then the, uh, fades to black. Okay, so this sounds great. What's the problem, right? Um, gravitational waves are all around us, right? And, but the, the problem is the, the gravitational wave strain is expected to be very small of order 10 to the minus 23. And so to put that in context, uh, the diameter of a proton over one kilometer is already 10 to the minus 18. You have a long way to go to get to 10 to the minus 23. Right, so you're, we're talking about doing better, a measurement better than the diameter of a proton um, over kilometer length um, uh, uh, scales. And so, um, you know, I think everyone, if they're, you know, should be freaking out at this point being like, you know, that's impossible, you can't do that to everything. Um, and so how do, you, how do you go about measuring these small distances? Okay, so the, the and the way that we do it, um, uh, it's known as LIGO, let's see, do I have, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so there are two uh, uh, of what we know of as interferometers um, here in the United States. Um, and a way an interferometer works, so if you look at the bottom left-hand side, you have a laser that goes to a beam splitter that's in the center there. So this, this laser goes out to a beam splitter, beam splitter takes, um, um, does what it sounds like and splits a beam um, and sends them out at 90 degrees relative to one another. Um, and out, out 90 degrees, four kilometers away along each arm is another mirror. So this laser travels down this path, goes to these mirrors, bounces off these mirrors and comes back. And the idea of an interferometer is if the distance between those two mirrors, these, these sort of 90 degree separated mirrors uh, are the same, you get no signal out at your, when it comes back to the beam splitter, you get uh, deconstructive interference and you get no signal out at uh, when it returns to the beam splitter. If the distances are different, you do see, you will see a characteristic pattern. And in, in our case, we measure it with a photodiode. Um, and so this, this instrument, if you think about it, is perfect for a gravitational wave detector because as a gravitational wave passes this thing, one mirror is getting further away, one mirror is getting closer, which means the distances are changing due to the gravitational waves passing. And so it's exactly this that we're measuring with our gravitational wave detectors. Um, as I said, they're four kilometers, four kilometer arms. There's one in, in uh, Washington state, one in Louisiana. Um, and uh, there's some around the world and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, and as I said, feel free to, I can't see the chat. So just, you know, yell at me. My students love to yell at me. So if you, if you wanna, if you want to stop, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, anyway, so, uh, so we've had this, 
this, these detectors, they, of course, this did not happen overnight. Um, so back in the, the 70s, uh, um, uh, uh, it was mostly a Caltech and MIT led project, um, which basically built prototypes, um, one at Caltech and one at MIT actually. Um, and that was sort of in the 70s and 80s. Um, this is an NSF funded project and has been since, you know, basically the beginning. Um, there was actually a competing project that's that still exists today. Um, that was um, that's called Virgo, actually. Funny for the Virgo cluster discussion. Um, that was uh, that's current that that that's right outside of Pisa, Italy, and they have three kilometer arms. Um, and so during the 90s, it was kind of an arms race building these things. Um, and then in the early early 2000s, um, sensitivities weren't that good, didn't see very much. Um, and but the luckily the the way the funding model worked is that um, these they built a first version of the gravitational detectors. They they reached some sensitivity limit that NSF required, and NSF then promised to build or fund a um, a detector ten times as sensitive for the next time. And this came online in the um, in the mid 2010s. Uh, it's known as Advanced LIGO um, and Advanced Virgo. And um, so we've been doing um, observations. We're in our third observation run. Sorry, we finished our third observation run a couple of years ago with those. And we're on to um, our fourth one next summer. Uh, and so this, so in the, um, towards the end of the 2020s, we're expecting more detectors to come online, and we'll talk about in a minute why that matters. And then 2030s, there's an expectation to build detectors yet again, 10 times more sensitive. I have a question. So it's, please. Uh, how do you make it more sensitive? Yeah, so, uh, so there's, there's, there's a handful of fundamental noise sources for these things, but the first one that you should have in mind, well, I need to measure something really small. Um, that means I need to isolate myself from the ground. Um, so the, the main, one of the main sources of noise for these gravitational detectors is indeed uh, the, the ground shaking, mostly due to the ocean actually. So the ocean um, at the, what they call the micro seism, but at something like 0.2 Hertz is actually booming. Like if I was to take a seismometer, put it on the ground, by far the loudest um, contingent would be even here, you know, here in Minnesota, the, the ocean. And so the seismic isolation systems continue to get basically larger. So the way Virgo does it is it takes a series of inverted pendulums, um, actually, something like nine, nine, nine of these inverted pendulums hanging from one another in order to isolate their system from the ground. Um, different, basically different people do this in different ways. And the other piece of this, as you go to higher frequencies, you basically need more laser power. So the, if you think of each photon as a measurement device, um, because you, so you have, you should envision in the interferometer, you have this cavity where you're shooting photons down at the mirror and it's coming back. And so each of those photons is kind of a measurement. The more photons you can have in your cavity, the more sensitivity you get. And so, um, the ability to ramp up that, um, the wattage in your laser and be able to basically lock or control the system is what's, what's driving your sensitivity here. Um, the future detectors in the 2030s to achieve that next order of magnitude, they're probably either going to go underground where it's seismically quieter, actually. So you can isolate yourself from humans, basically, because the at 10 hertz or that, that we're talking about, humans are, are quite, uh, um, let's say, noisy with their cars and that kind of thing. Um, or you make your your interferometer very long. So right now we're at four kilometers. Well, the I, the Cosmic Explorer, which is a MIT-led um, prototype project or prospective project, they try to make it 40 kilometers. And so, so building a 40 kilometer vacuum, that's tough, expensive, and all sorts of other things. Um, the Europeans want to put their detector underground, a triangle-shaped interferometer that's more moderate in size. So um, that's sort of the... Space. Or you can put it in space. And this talk, I, I would have to give another hour long talk on Lisa, but indeed um, uh, there's a, there's a, a European led mission called Lisa um, that will be doing millihertz. Um, so it's in a different band than LIGO works. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a future space based detector in here somewhere too. Um, that's in like, 
you know, people claim kind of 2030s, it's more like 2040s probably, but yeah, that's that should be probably included on this timeline, but it's a little bit different of a science case. So. I'm, I'm curious what wavelength of light you're using in the lasers. So, uh, I mean, if you go from red to blue or something, you get a higher resolution or more sensitivity, right? Yeah, so it's, so uh, uh, we're just at 1062, um, but the, uh, uh, for, what we're, for what we're doing now, the, uh, it's more, our main issue is uh, actually in our mirror coatings. How can we minimally heat up our mirrors, basically create coatings such that we have as high reflectivity as possible and- Heat the mirrors with the lasers. Yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I apologize. I, I no, <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, no, it's exactly right. And so that's that's the fundamental issue. So the Japanese with Kagura, which turned on recently, they actually um, uh, they cool their mirrors to cryogenic temperatures, and they're they're trying to defeat thermal noise in the mirrors by you know cooling them down essentially. So this is that's the main focus for the for the choice of wavelength and laser power, how, how can I avoid my mirrors heating up and therefore thermally exciting things and creating noise? I had heard they're uh, trying to do something with squeezing the light to get the photon arrival time with the sensors, a uh, better time, do, do you know anything about that? That's right, so um, all three detectors have now achieved what's known as squeezed light. So this is, uh, so when people say squeezed light, it's uh, uh, what they mean is, um, there's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which in general is talked about in terms of I can't know uh, uh, position and velocity, you know, to arbitrary position. In this case, you can also think of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle as an energy and a time. And so uh, the the idea here is that um, uh, if since in this case we're, I mean, you can think about it multiple ways, but um, by uh, let's say um, releasing the need to measure the energy of the photon particularly well, but instead me measure the, the, the delta T, the arrival time better, you can, reduce, um, uh, you can reduce your shot noise that way. And so this, is, this has been achieved in all of our detectors at this point, it, it increased our sensitivity by you know, a factor of a handful. Um, and so it's a regular, um, it's now almost old hat running these um, um, uh, these squeezed light um, inputs at the at the photodiodes. Yep. Uh, a yeah. Question. Go ahead. Uh, is there something called quantum optics? I believe I heard that was necessary to uh, to get the accuracy. Yeah. So that's exactly what we were. Uh, well, that's. That's closely related to what we were talking about here. Basically, the the um, the, the the standard quantum limit, you know, and so we're we're dealing with quantum optics, of course, because we're we're doing interferometry and interferometry. Um, but yeah, so that was basically the the um, uh, the whole deal with the um, uh, with the squeeze light measurement. Um, and maybe we should. If everyone's super interested in that, maybe we should have a friend of mine who works on that give a talk at some point. Okay, so I should, just for the sake of your time, I should move on because I will, otherwise we'll, we'll talk about gravitational wave detectors all day. Um, okay, so uh, uh, as I said, this field's pretty young. Uh, it's, we've had detectors for, you know, of some sorts for the last, you know, 40 odd years, something like that. Um, but it wasn't until September uh, 2015 that we had our first gravitational wave detection. Um, so what you see in this, these plots here on the, the, this top, this is the chirp signal in a time series, right? So the, you have the, you have two black holes, they're going around one another, coming together and merging, and you're getting the whoop as they, as they merge. And so the, the top plot shows the, the gravitational wave strain and it gets larger and larger until it peaks. And at that point they've merged and then it's losing energy as it rings down. That's the word people actually use, ring down like a bell um, in, the, in the object that comes out at the end. Um, and so it's this uh, chirp signal that um, at the bottom here, that's, and that's, that's what people usually think of when they think of our, our detections nowadays. Um, 
And so it was observed in our two detectors in both of our LIGO detectors, one in Washington, one in Louisiana, which indeed you know, confirmed for us, it agreed with general relativity. It was a fantastic event. Um, and it won um, a handful of people a Nobel Prize. Um, I was excited, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, but, you know, even in the Nobel Prize, you know, thing they named, you know, like, and, you know, it's like Ray Weiss, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, you know, and the LIGO and Virgo collaboration kind of stuff or whatever. So in somewhere deep down inside, I have this small sliver of Nobel and that, that'll be my, you know, um, feels good or something. Um, but, you know, that was, that was back in 2015. Uh, we found a ton of black holes since. Um, so every, um, so all of these, these, these blue dots that point to another blue dot, that's the size of the original black hole. And then they merged and created a larger black hole. So we're really doing um, black hole spectroscopy, like measuring the mass function of black holes at this point using the gravitation wave detectors. Um, at the very bottom of this plot, you can see these neutron stars and we'll talk about those in a second as well. Okay, so um, for so for a while we were de de detecting a ton of black holes. That was great um, doing these you know these cool measurements, um, and then we found something a little bit different. And so um, at the top, if if you look back at this plot here, oh, I don't even have the axis. It's something like a handful of uh, some handfuls of milliseconds that it takes for these binary black holes to merge. Um, this guy was in band for something like 30 seconds. And what does, and in gravitational wave land, what does that mean? Well, as the, as the mass of the objects that are merging get lower, the time scale for this chirp gets longer. And so what this told us that since it was, it took 30 seconds to merge, that we had very, very low mass objects. These were not black holes anymore, but instead they were neutron stars. Why is that cool? Well, you know, I'm talking to a crowd of, you know, optical astronomers. These are the kind of signals that you can actually point telescopes at to go look for. Um, and so this was a fantastic event. Um, so this was in August of 2017. Um, uh, LIGO detected this signal. Ten hours later, um, six different surveys. So on the right-hand side here, you have an image of you know host galaxy, and then you know a pointer towards this this little dot here that uh, was the the optical counterpart of these two neutron stars that were merging. Um, and it set off, this, this, this event set off maybe the largest astronomy campaign in history. I don't know, I think that's dangerous to say, but it, you know, a lot of, let's say very large telescopes across every wavelength pointed at this thing for the, um, the handful of weeks that they could. Um, and it was exceptional for many reasons. Um, it was detected in, um, gamma rays, x-rays, UV visible, infrared, and the radio, it's still visible in the radio actually. Um, and so the, um, this truly was one of the, um, uh, this, you know, a truly exceptional event in many ways. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the science of, you know, neutron stars, neutron star mergers, but um, for example, uh, as a, just as, you know, a few examples. We were able to measure the what's known as the equation of state of neutron star, which basically means the mass radius relation that based on the fact that the, the neutron stars are tidally deformable and that affects the, the gravitation waves. We were able to measure the expansion rate of the universe um, using both the gravitational waves and the, um, the host galaxy of the, of the object. Um, we were able to make a, and at least an attempt to claim that um, Neutron star mergers are a um, at least a source of heavy elements in the universe. Think things like gold, um, things beyond iron, and so it was a uh, you know many nature papers, many science papers, a ton of science came out. It was it was truly fabulous. Okay, so that happened a few years ago now. Um, you know, uh, it turns out that this that an event that of this kind, something that, that nearby should, would only be, would only come around every say 40 years or so. And so are we gonna be waiting every 40 years to, to see another thing like that? Um, well, we've done gravitation wave searches since. Um, and so uh, this, is a, uh, this is a plot of the sky, obviously, but more interesting, uh, you, you get, when you do gravitational wave searches, you get these big swatches of the sky that you need to look. Gravitational wave detectors are a lot like antennae and they have, um, uh, 
they have antenna responses that cover a large fraction of the sky actually. And so they're, they're not much better than timing instruments. And so really you need two or three instruments to actually make um, reasonable localizations with these things. Otherwise, really, you're just sort of going to be measuring big rings on the sky. Um, and that's what's going on in this plot. For most of them, they're detected by Hubble detectors. And, you know, as, as observers yourselves, right, you'll notice, wow, that's a lot of places to have to take a picture of. Um, and so uh, they reckon they, these, these, uh, these sky maps or sky areas from these gravitational detectors um, during the last science run, reg regularly covered a thousand to five thousand square degrees. So, you know, no joke to try to try to do follow up with. Um, and so, how does one do this? If you know, I'm, if I don't know the galaxy that I'm supposed to point at, right? Um, so, we take uh, large field of view cameras. Um, uh, the one I work on is a fifty square degree imager. Um, we tile the sky. You know, on the top left hand side here, you, you make tiles and take images of those. And then you look for transients within those. Um, you uh, get photometry and maybe spectroscopy of your candidates and hopefully identify and characterize your object. Um, but as you can imagine, this is a, um, this is a challenging, you know, uh, a challenging thing. Uh, the other way that you can do it and is, you know, relevant. Um, for this crowd, um, because the gravitational detectors are only sensitive out to our nearby universe, say, you know, a couple hundred megaparsecs, um, we know a lot of the galaxies that are within a few hundred megaparsecs. And so you can actually go and point um, at, you know, galaxy, 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 um, and in that way, kind of go through the same process. And both of these methods were used for the event, the binary trans star event I talked about um, and have been used since. And so this is, these are kind of the two paradigms for how people do this. Um, yeah. Okay, so what's different about transient observing? You know, I, I wanted to throw this plot there, throw this, uh, um, this plot on the slide. You know, in my other life, I spent times trying, trying to do, look for a short period white dwarf binaries where here, I just sort of sit on an object and I take a picture of it over and over again. Um, so the transient observing, of course, is a little bit different. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to highlight, this is the system I like to use, the Kit Peak 84 inch. I, I have a robotic um, high-speed imager on there that took the movie from just before. Um, and we also do gravitational follow-up with it. Um, but yeah, so what's the sort of, you know, in the at least on the, um, uh, in the gravitational wave domain, you know, what is the, what is the situation? Um, so I, I'll just mention here briefly ZTF, which is on the, the right-hand side of this plot. Um, it's a 50 square degree imager. It has 16 CCDs in a mosaic. Um, it's on the um, Palomar 1.2 meter, which is just outside of um, LA. Um, and so we use, we use wide field of view telescopes like this to, um, uh, to search for these gravitational counterparts. Um, so the, as I mentioned, it's the 48 inch on the same mountain. We have uh, a 60 inch and a 200 inch, which we use for follow-up. Basically the 48 inches are transient finder and we use um, sort of the larger telescopes on the mountain to get um, spectroscopy of. Um, one highlight is known as the SED machine, um, which is on the bottom right hand side here. It's a four channel imager with a um, integral field unit spectrograph at the center. So you can do both imaging and spectroscopy of sources pretty rapidly. So that's kind of the workhorse instrument we at least currently use for, for a lot of our for a lot of our work here. Um, I just wanted to quickly show this little movie. Um, so this is the inside of the 48 inch beam tube. And so at the, you can see the, you can see the camera, and what's happening here is that the the filter is being replaced, and so you have this arm that literally reaches down and pulls, you know, so you see your mosaic here. It pulls the filter off, it puts it down into a slot down here, it grabs a new one and pulls it back, and so uh, I still think this is as a instrument builder myself. This is the most terrifying thing that I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, but uh, anyways, it's a pretty cool, uh, um, it's a pretty cool instrument, pretty cool design. Um, yeah, so that's CTF. Okay, uh, 
what's hard about this, right? So I said, you know, you, you have to look over some, you know, some uh, area of the sky, fair enough. You know, we, we think we ought to do that with tiling. Um, but the other thing that makes this hard is kilonovi, um, they fade fast and they're subluminous. And what, what I mean by that, so if you look on the left-hand side here, um, this red curve, so all these black curves are supernovae. And uh, as I go on the y-axis and magnitudes, you know, things are getting brighter, right? And so all the black curves, they're brighter and they last longer. Great, you know, if I'm a supernova person, I'm super happy, right? Um, if I'm a kilonova person, I'll notice it's, it's, it's not very bright and it fades very fast over the course of a night or two. Um, and so uh, it's absolutely brutal to go find these things. It means that you have to go, you have to look over this thousand square degrees on the order of a couple of nights. And therefore you, you need to get all of the, the data that you want to analyze you know, over that time scale. So it's, it's quite an observational challenge. And so the, um, the point here is that the, the survey data, so this is, a, this is a plot of various bands of um, you know, 2017. But I point out here, kind of GR and I band is the kind of bands that we use for a lot of our survey work. Maybe it gets you the early time data, but really you require an incredible amount of follow-up across a variety of, um, of wavelengths in order to fully characterize and identify these things. And so a lot of, at least as much of the work comes from, you know, point your survey telescope as, you know, go outside or, um, you know, find, you know, um, follow-up systems to take images of the correct galaxy at that point, basically. Um, so I wanted, you know, before we, um, you know, as we get to wrapping up here, I just, you know, how, you know, how can folks be involved in this kind of thing? Well, I'm, I'm sure some, some folks know about um, Zooniverse, right? And so we have multiple Zooniverse programs, both within LIGO and within CTF. Um, Gravity Spy actually was partially developed by my brother for his PhD. Um, and in this case, you, uh, you look at gravitational wave data, you look at spectrograms and identify different, let's say, noise transients, as well as, you know, um, gravitational waves that exist in that data stream. And so it's a highly popular, highly effectual um, citizen science program we use to use machine learning in the end to help clean our, clean our data when we go to gravitational wave searches. We also have similar things within ZTF. We, um, we have multiple programs at this point. Um, some are based on um, imaging, like Swicky's quirky transients, where you look at um, help identify real bogus and other kinds of, you know, supernovae and other kinds of transients. Um, we have one that's based on spectroscopy from the, the 60 inch SED machine I talked about. And so it's, it's one way that we really benefit from um, engagement. Probably at least as interesting for this crowd is um, we're um, part of a collaboration known as Grandma, which is actually um, French led. And they have a citizen science, um, amateur astronomy, you know, let's say arm to their um, collaboration that's known as Kilonova Catcher. And so um, the idea is you connect amateur astronomers to um, do follow up. And so the, um, uh, the idea is a gravitational wave alert comes in um, and through us, at least currently, it's through a Slack channel, um, uh, you know, folks like you are notified, you know, you can go observe this galaxy, try to get it down to a particular magnitude, you know, based on the sort of expectation from the gravitational waves, you can get a sense for how bright you'd expect a counterpart to be. And you can um, use it to uh, potentially make discoveries in this, this you know, new area of uh, multi-messenger astronomy. During the last observing run, this, this group had something like 40 participants. Now there's over 100 folks on the Slack channel. It's a little chaotic, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and so uh, if you want to get involved, um, there's a, a friend of mine, um, her email's there. Um, and the, the, the next kind of ramp up period to get ready for the next observing run starts this summer. And so um, if you'd like to be involved, you just send that email or whatever. She's pretty nice. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm closing with um, just a few links um, to a few um, other places where you might know, learn more. Gram, the Grandma Network has this really nice curated list of YouTube seminars, kind of like I'm giving, but maybe at a little, um, maybe a, uh, maybe a little lower level technically. Um, 
And then uh, I'm also part of the Caltech led collaboration called Growth and it's got it also very useful. I, I got the wrong, um, I'll replace that link when I send you guys the slides. But anyways, there's a nice um, page that, that summarizes um, uh, tutorials and such that they have on this stuff. And so anyways, um, that's what I prepared. So hopefully that was <laughs> hopefully that was interesting, I guess. Yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome, Dr. Coughlin, it was great. I know I enjoyed it and I got excited when you started talking about ways for us amateurs to contribute. My ears perked up. Is there any questions out there from anybody? I didn't see anything in the chat. I just went through the chat a, a couple minutes ago. And I Should didn't... we ask in the chat or should we just barge in? Oh, just barge in. Dr. Coughlin, I hate to get away from LIGO because it's so interesting, but my ears perked up when you said Carlton. Did you get to work at the Goodsell Observatory? I did. And so I, you know, that was my first observing experience. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually I went on to, let's say, um, you know, Cheritololo and, you know, Haleakala and that kind of thing. But nothing will be as good as, you know, good soul. <laughs> yeah. Did you get to crank up the, the uh, clock drive? I did. I, uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, I still think that that, um, I, I'm, and I'm sure many of you have had this experience, right? Like different observatories are, you know, well, they're, 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 they require different amounts of, let's say, manual whatever. And so good cell is still maybe the best experience that you can have before going to, let's say, a more, you know, I don't know, professional telescope where maybe, you know, I don't know, the dome slews it's a bit better and you know it's a little I mean in this case Kit Peak is a little bit more robotic but yeah I mean it's still the best uh, still the best observing experience I've ever had for sure yeah so a question on the chat is uh were you there when it they when it turned into R2 R2D2 I was <laughs> yep I kid you not I was there from 2008 to 2012 and I looked out my lab window I was in the the uh the second floor of the building sorry, third floor of the building right across. And yeah, I was, I was there. <laughs> I definitely knew the people who did it too. It was great. Yep. That's awesome. I have a question about the um, detector and stuff like that. Uh, well, I guess I was curious if you're looking for neutron stars colliding, is there, I don't know what the gravitational limits are, or the mass limits are, could they turn into a black hole and go from being something like a pulsar to being something where you're going to get radio jets out of it? That's exactly right, right. So um, black hole, black hole interactions are not particularly interesting because you get a black hole. Neutron star black hole interestings are also not particularly interesting. I mean, they are, but you know, because you get a black hole. Neutron star, neutron stars are interesting because you either can get uh, one option if you have very low mass neutron stars, another neutron star. You go from, you know, something, you know, probably near the mass, last mass, mass limit of a neutron star, or if you get something that's just a little larger, you get a higher mass neutron star that's, relative, that's, fast, that's spinning very, very fast. It loses angular momentum due to emission of gravitation waves and so on. And then it collapses to a black hole when it slows down. Or if they start out being kind of large neutron stars, then you immediately get, get a black hole. And so depending on the, the remnant object, you get different gravitation waves coming out. And obviously you also get different EM signatures coming out. So you can really study the remnant object by looking at what happens afterwards in, in both the gravitation waves and EM data. It's, it's real cool with these neutrons. Have, you seen, have you seen something like that yet or is this still theoretical? Yeah, so the, the uh, based on the light curve that we had from 7.17. Um, so we, we went and looked in gravitational waves and it, our, the sensitivity of our detectors just wasn't quite good enough during O2, the last observing run where we fought, saw this. By not this next observing run, but maybe the next one for that same event, we, we probably, we could have seen the gravitational waves from those. The inference here, or the expectation based on this one was that we had a short-lived uh, neutron star then that, that then collapsed to a black hole. 
um, based on the, the light curve that we saw. And so that's what we think happened to this one. We had an event during 03 where we didn't see the EM signature from it, and partially because we didn't see any EM signature from it, and also partially from the gravitational wave measurement, we think it was one of those cases where it was a very, you know, two large neutron stars that immediately had uh, that collapsed to a black hole. And so no neutron star, which really limits the electromagnetic output. So that was the second event we had. And, and, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Um, have all the collisions been extragalactic, or are there any in the Milky Way that you've detected? Yeah, so thus far, um, uh, everything's been extragalactic, and just based, based on rates, that, that is consistent with what we'd expect. In terms of galactic, um, we have a very active group that is very excited for the next galactic supernova in particular. I mean, the, um, you know, the, probably the if, if people would ask what is the most exciting source that is to come, it's probably a supernova in our galaxy. And so um, there you get the gravitational waves, you get the neutrinos, and obviously you get the, the EM data. Maybe it's you know heavily reddened due to the, the, the dust, but um, that's probably, I think, what most gravitational wave astronomers would say is the, is the next thing. Um, you know, someone brought up LISA, right? I mean, so, um, uh, for LISA, their dominant source is uh, white dwarf binaries in our galaxy. And I showed a light curve, you know, one of those with the little movie or whatever. Um, and their LISA will be totally dominated by galactic white dwarf binaries. So there's your sort of galactic um, gravitational wave source. Yeah, but for, for now, um, uh, you know, the closer the better. You know, if you can get something that goes off in, um, you know, M31 or something like that, you know, we're doing really well in gravitational waves. So um, I guess we'll just see what comes. I've got a uh, question on, on when you do get the optical signal, um, mm -hmm. is it, is it uh, valuable to do any polarimetry, spectral polarimetry on the objects? Are they big enough for resolution? Yeah, so uh, yet another friend of mine wrote a nature astronomy paper, I think, on spectral polarimetry of Kilinovi. Uh, so the, uh, the big question there is um, uh, how to disentangle different components of this ejecta. So um, typically, people, so you, you have these neutron stars, they merge. Um, you have some component that is flung out, um, what they call dynamically, but basically that's tidally disrupted and, you know, just ejected um, and sort of, you know, off into space. Um, then you have another component that is expected to be from the remnant disk. So even if you form a black, so you have two neutron stars, they um, come together, they form a black hole. Around that, you'll still have a disk of material um, who undergoes our, our process, our process nucleosynthesis and generates um, you know, optical signatures. Disentangling those two components at least partially relies on the ability to do spectral polarimetry. Um, um, and therefore, uh, it's, a, it's a hard measurement because it's expected to be sort of percent level, round numbers. Um, yeah. uh, and so, but uh, uh, yeah, this, this dude who's a theorist was on a, one of these Caltech proposals to try to do it with, um, um, to try to do it with Keck, um, you know, if we had another, you know, hopefully actually the near buyer event, because, you know, 1%, that's, you know, tough life. Um, yeah. uh, so, you know, and because they're already intrinsically faint and so on. But yeah, I mean, in principle, it'd be a fabulous measurement to be able to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so that was just one follow-up question. Then when you do get the gravitational wave signal, is there an analog for polarization in that? Like you separate a optical wave into uh, X and Y? That's right. And so uh, 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 we call them, oh, nope, that, that did not end up like I thought it would. Let's see, can I share screen again? Uh, yes, you should be able to. I, well, I can't, I, and I, and then my presentation's gone. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll just not try to do that again. Uh, uh, we call them H plus and H cross. So the, we have in, in general relativity, you have um, uh, two components. One is the, um, uh, well, it's what it sounds like, the plus one and the cross one <laughs> as the, as Major and minor ellipse, yeah. That's right. When you're, yeah. when we, when we're talking about sort of the, the expansion and contraction of space time mm -hmm. part. Um, and so uh, we can, 
we can measure um, uh, to some degree sort of the um, the phase in H plus H cross because it's it's constantly let's say changing interchanging as it passes through space or whatever but we can um, uh, you can we can measure the phase relative to those two um, because we have multiple detectors if we had one detector we couldn't do it but we have multiple detectors the the main issue there is we by design the two LIGO detectors are actually co-aligned they're they're far away from each other but they're co-aligned um, and the reason being that it, it maximizes your sensitivity, your relative sensitivity to a gravitation that passes, but it actually minimizes your sensitivity to this phase difference between H plus and H cross, which is why actually you want, you know, Virgo or Cagra or whatever the other detectors are that I mentioned um, to be able to actually make the polarization measurement effectively. Um, and so we've, we've done it for some of our binary black holes that Virgo saw. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Dr. Coughlin, there's one other question. What somebody asked, what is a kilonova? I, you know, I, I, I realized, it, you know, because I wrote, to be fair, I wrote these slides, you know, in the, in sort of, you know, earlier today. And I, I did have, um, I had, I, anyways, a kilonova is the, um, uh, is the byproduct of um, uh, one of these binary neutron star mergers where you have neutron rich material um, that undergoes what's known as R process nucleosynthesis, where you have basically, you should think of neutrons at really high velocities go and smash together so that they can, they become very large, but then, um, and so you build heavy elements out of those, but then they rapidly decay because they're unstable. And so you have these gamma rays coming out from these high energy, um, sorry, these very heavy atoms that pass through and thermalize the surrounding material. This thermal material radiates in the near infrared as you know everything does, right? And is, uh, produces light that's known as a kilonova. So indeed, I should have had a slide in there. That's a really good point. Um, uh, but that's, it's basically the, the light signature that we've been talking about with these, these binary neutron stars. Is there a chance we could see one? I mean, there's, I, I sure hope that uh, in your, um, you know, if you sign up or consider signing up for Kilonova Catcher or whatever during 04, well, we should have a bunch of my neutron stars. Um, hopefully some of them are nearby. They peak at minus 16. And so if they're, they're bright enough, you know, you can, you too can take an image of one of these things. Um, so I sure hope so. Yep. That'd be nuts. I have a question. It's kind of a little bit out there. Is there an analogy be, uh, between like the dielectric and electromagnetic waves and the amount of mass between one of these events and the gravitational waves being slowed down at different frequencies because of that, that intervening mass? Is there anything analogous to that? So gravitational waves in GR are truly weakly interacting in the sense of they, they, they are not... Um, uh, uh, while they, in some sense, you know, interfere and just constructively and deconstructively with each other, they don't, um, uh, it's not like as they pass through the earth or something, they lower in amplitude. Um, and that's by, and that's just a result of, um, of Einstein's equations. That's not true in other, um, in beyond GR, where you have some sort of scalar field or something like that. The problem is nowadays um, with this um, with this binary neutron star that we detected, the gravitational waves and the gamma rays arrive within 1.2 seconds of each other, and that's and that's 1.2 seconds over something that was 40 megaparsecs away, and so that the difference in those terms has now been set at you know the one part in 10 to the 16 level or something like that, and so actually it really killed a lot of those theories where you'd get. Um, you know, anything, you know, something like a scalar field or something, you know, basically beyond, you know, Einstein. And so um, the answer is probably no. Yeah. Oh, no, good. that's good. Thank you. Well, if there's no further questions, thank you, Dr. Coughlin, for spending uh, an hour with us tonight. That was, it was excellent. I, uh, I learned a few things and I'm excited about a couple of things. So I have to check that's out great. that Kilanova thing. That's right. Um, yeah, I'll send the slides to um, Suresh, and uh, yeah, thank you all for having me. It was really nice. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.
Oh, unless you have something else, Mark. No, don't, don't, don't stop the recording. I have one last slide. Okay. Ah, yes. There's a big name speaker. And now it is April 1st, Mark. Are you fooling us with that name? What's that? No, I am not. I am not fooling you. That is, that is, I'm serious about that. That is, uh, that is who is going to be here. And uh, I'm excited about it. I hope all of you. And that is uh, the conclusion for the meeting for this month. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a good evening.